All right. Welcome, everyone. Uh, as Will said, my name is James Rote. Um, I myself am a settler here in Vancouver, having moved from Canmore, Alberta, about seven years ago. Uh, my family originally hails from England and the Ukraine. My ancestors moved to Canada in the early part of the 20th century. And so, as Will has said, I would like to note that this event is taking place on the unceded ancestral territorial, territorial lands of the Coast Salish Indigenous people, including the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh. And I'm very honored to welcome you here to the BCIT's downtown campus. Uh, thank you for joining me in the conversation tonight. I, I also would like to thank SFU, BC, BCIT, and UBC um, for planning and sponsoring this event. Um, I hope you'll join me in thanking uh, Hope Power, Rebecca Dowson, Will Engel, Leonora Crema, Rosario Passos, and Lynn Brander for all of their work in organizing this. So thank you all. So this week there are events taking place all over the world to reflect on, advocate, share, and celebrate Open Access Week. From Nazarbayev University in Kazakhstan to the University of Gujarat, from Botswana to Brazil, the open movement is global, it's far-reaching, and it's transformative. And yet, as we're going to reflect on this evening, there remain many barriers and challenges to open scholarship. And we must accept that there are indeed tensions in open education that are as yet unresolved and in need of further dialogue. So I think it's important to remember the roots of Open Access Week, which started with the National Day of Action for Open Access that was organized by student groups in the US back in 2007. So, we all know the student voice is so important in this movement. I had a meeting just last week with some of our student association executives to discuss open education at BCIT. And as you might imagine, the conversation uh, really centered around the cost savings afforded to students using open resources. But we also talked about the educational value of open pedagogy. We also have to acknowledge the tension that exists between encouraging instructors to use open resources and to engage in open teaching methods and their academic freedom to choose resources and strategies that they believe are the most effective materials for teaching and learning, whether open or otherwise. So in my conversations with instructors, many have expressed their concern that by releasing their work under an open license, they're giving away their work, or they have concerns about how their value as instructors may be diminished. They have misconceptions about how Creative Commons licensing impacts their intellectual property rights. How can we advance the principles of the open movement while respecting the diversity and complexity of perspectives around these issues? At many academic institutions, the processes we've put in place for achieving tenure and promotion often serve to pressure scholars to hold on tightly to their work. In many ways, it remains a publisher parish world in academia, and open scholarship practices like sharing software, data, or open resources are either actively discouraged or at best overlooked when considering faculty for promotion or tenure, for example. So on that note, it's really encouraging to see our institutions moving forward with open access policies, as the universities can play a huge role in shaping a culture of openness and scholarship. We know that open education is not just about creating and sharing resources to improve education in local contexts. It's about much more than content. I see it as more about an opportunity to explore open pedagogy as we deepen and expand our shared understanding of learning, teaching, research, and scholarship. So I'm very pleased that we're able to have these open conversations this evening. Um, I think we can continue to reflect on advancing the principles of the open movement to understand how we can reduce the barriers and challenges to equitable access to research and education, and to consider how we can empower our students, staff, and faculty to serve as ambassadors of the open movement. So this evening we'll hear from a panel of speakers who will be addressing these and other risks, challenges, and barriers in open scholarship. So we're joined by Amanda Coolidge from BC Campus, Sue Donner from Camosun College, David Gardner from UBC, Jessica Gallinger from SFU Library, Christina Ilnitici from the Alma Mater Society of UBC, and Lisa Nathan from the School of Library, Archival, and Information Studies at UBC. So thank you all for taking the time to share your thoughts and expertise this evening, and thank you all for listening. Um, okay, thanks so much for um, being a part of this event tonight. Thank you to all of the panelists. Uh, we're going to start, um, just so you know, I'm Amanda Coolidge. I'll be doing the um, questions for tonight, so I don't, I'm not going to be the answerer. I'll be um, putting everybody else on the spot. 
So um, I have a series of questions to ask, and before we begin, I would like each person on the panel just to introduce themselves and briefly um, provide an explanation as to what brought you here tonight. Hi everyone, I'm Christina. I work for the Alma Mater Society at UBC. Specifically, I work in the academic office doing campaigns and outreach. Um, over the past three years, we've been doing the Textbook Broke BC campaign, which serves to engage students in um, the conversation about the affordability of textbooks and how open education resources can be a solution to this problem. Hi everyone, my name is Jessica Gallinger. I'm a research data management librarian at SFU Library. So uh, my perspective tonight is largely focused around open data and concerns are um, issues around secondary use of data, things like getting meaningful consent from participants, um, as well stretching back further in time. Um, in 2013, I was one of the organizers for the Stand Up for Science rally in Toronto. Um, so th I think that's really the origins of a lot of my interest in open data, um, around kind of ideological framing of open data, for example, at that time by the federal conservative government, um, who launched an open government initiative, an open data initiative, who put forward statements like, um, open data is the natural resource of the 21st century. While at the same time, uh, dramatically putting forward cuts to Statistics Canada, eliminating the law firm census, muzzling scientists, and closing federal science libraries. So I think certainly there's uh, a lot of ideology in open, and it's not always as um, transparent as we might assume. Uh, my name is Dave Gardner. I'm an instructor in the First Nations and Indigenous Studies program at UBC, where I specialize in uh, digital media, um, storytelling, and knowledge dissemination. And I think I just want to take up that point because I think thinking of open access as a natural resource when we're thinking of it within the context of critical Indigenous studies is intensely fraught. Because traditionally, natural resources and Indigenous knowledges have been seen as something that can be expro expropriated from communities. Um, and taken without any boundaries. And, and I think when we're thinking about open and those contexts, and when we're, the metaphors in which open access are framed in, particularly metaphors like this, can often contribute to um, ideologies of uh, terra nullius, uh, doctrine of discovery, which can further work to um, displace uh, indigenous peoples and knowledges. So my stake in this conversation, while I am a proponent of open access, I think, um, for far too long, uh, knowledge dissemination has been unidirectional with Indigenous communities. It goes so far as that we have academics working in those communities to take data, but there is no reciprocity, there is no giving back. Um, part of what my work is involved in is thinking outside of the walls of the ivory tower and how we can get students using open to give back to communities and to speak uh, to audiences beyond the walls of the academy. But I think open access um, is intensely problematic, particularly when we're thinking about open access on unceded territories. Uh, and when we're talking about freedom of information uh, in a place which is built and exists on the repression of information, insofar as the repression of these facts, the fact that this is stolen territory and the genocide that the nation state is built on, I think there's a pretty problematic um, issue um, and contradiction at stake in there. Um, so unless we're willing to unpack on what open means on unceded territories. I think to evoke the questions this panel is based on, um, open for who and open for what. Um, thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Sue Doner, and I'm an instructional designer uh, now at Cabosan College in Victoria. Um, I'm here as I have a, a deep and long uh, interest in accessibility and universal design for learning. Uh, a few years ago, I co-created with Amanda and Tara Robertson the BC um, Open Textbook Accessibility Toolkit. So that's where I landed in open first. Um, I, I, I don't feel that accessibility is necessarily maybe as fraught or controversial in this, in this context, uh, but uh, equally so I'd say that I, I'd like to see that open embraces opportunities versus, say, the status quo that we frequently see in, in higher ed now, which is the sort of the default, the accommodation, the medical model of accommodating students who have disability, et cetera, instead of the uh, more proactive uh, addressing of, of removing barriers before, before students arrive, creating that welcoming 
um, and I think Open has has a great potential to to bridge that. Um, not least which because I think there's so much opportunity for collaboration between different knowledge holders of accessibility. And I also think that Open, uh, when we get into the Open Pedagogy side of things. Um, may serve as a great launching place for, for helping students to develop their own literacy around making things accessible. So that's my stake here today. Thank you. Um, my name is Lisa Nathan, and I am a associate uh, professor at the School of Library, Archival, and Information Studies at the University of British Columbia. I'm also the coordinator for our school's First Nations curriculum concentration. I am a uh, settler scholar here in Vancouver, on, um, and I live and work on Musqueam ancestral, traditional ancestral and unceded land. And many of the statements that have already been made and the reflections I would echo. Um, I would also say that for me, this is an ongoing um, point of tension when I teach at a school and the classes and the people that I work with and the colleagues that I have the pleasure of working with um, spend a lot of time. Um, developing professional and, and uh, professional ethos, professional norms um, that don't necessarily instill skills such as humility and the ability to listen. And I, I worry about things such as open access, which I think has some really fantastic things to offer. But when you're an opponent and you are advocating for something really strongly, sometimes it's hard for you to listen and to hear those um, whose who may have questions and concerns um, that really are important to take into account while you are also working towards a, a hopefully a shared goal that you develop together. So that's my stake, I guess. So I think, so I think the three of you down there will be using that mic. Oh. <laughs> we'll use um, thank you so much for those introductions. That was really fabulous. <clears throat> so based on what you introduced, um, sort of your interest in and really a lot of the um, issues that we're seeing around the open movement. I'm curious, um, what ideologies and privileges do you see open supporting? Anybody, anybody, um, we're gonna just, whoever wants to go first. I don't wanna put anybody on the spot just yet, so. Just yet. Yeah, we'll let Dave go because he's reaching for it. Yeah, sure. awkwardness of who's going to go next makes me nervous. So my, my propensity is to just fill space, which is not always the best idea <laughs> when we're talking about listening. <laughs> um, uh, I think that, again, um, as a proponent of OPEN and somebody who uh, works with students to think about how they can uh, respond to community and work in ways that gives back um, and extends beyond the boundaries of the university, I think open can be a really useful tool. Um, but I just want to uh, read a quote from some research um, by Deirdre Brown and George Nicholas, um, who highlight some of the costs of the costs of open access to indigenous communities. Um, so they identify those costs as including loss of access to ancestral knowledge, loss of control over proper care of heritage, diminished respect for sacred, uh, for the sacred commercialization of cultural distinctiveness, uses of special or sacred symbols that may be dangerous to the uninitiated, replacement of originally tribally produced work with reproductions, threats to authenticity, um, and loss of livelihood, um, among other things. Uh, I think, to speak to Lisa's point as well, um, open has become such a prevalent ideology, and I think one, as somebody who identifies as being in that broad sense of, of the left, becomes um, such a, a space of excitement that often it occludes voices of dissent. Uh, and I think unless we're willing to listen to those voices and to think about the ways um, in which open access can um, appropriate voice and reenact systems of settler colonialism, um, that we need to be careful um, about, um, we need to be more critical about the ideologies that may be carried in a system like that. Um, and really be intersectional critical thinkers um, when exploring the ways in which um, an ideology that has so much potential um, can actually cause a lot of harm. Regarding, um, in particular, I kind of wanted to pick up on what um, uh, Dave said regarding neocolonialism. And I'm curious if 
Um, Lisa, you might follow up on that in terms of how might open be construed as neocolonial based on what um, David also said. I, I think that there's, it also goes, I think, back to some of the things that Sue was raising um, in terms of the things that become taken for granted and the norms, um, the mundane qualities of this is how you go about things. So you were talking about how the, the, the dominant model now is that students come with some kind of uh, accessibility letter and then you respond to that rather than at the forefront of the class, in this case, thinking of a, a course. Um, thinking about ways that you can make the, the materials, all of the various ways, accessible to a, a wide range of um, different uh, physical abilities, different learning styles, um, and that being the point of starting. And I think for, um, you know, the neo-colonial, I am not so, uh, I'm not versed in that language of uh, the, that even that, um, there's a lot of labels and a lot of really powerful um, ways of structuring that, and I, I appreciate that. But I, what works better for me is thinking about that very simple, very simply in terms of who's benefiting and, um, and, and who's not. And I think there are so many ways that even from the Creative Commons licensing and the dominant um, model, which we're all working within a copyright regime here in Canada that has a, a, a clearly a colonial legacy that you know go back to the statute of again and where we're coming from with how we think about ownership of intellectual property um, as a fundamentally colonial idea and ideology. Um, so then the Creative Commons people will say, well, that's an alternative. It's not an alternative. It is built on copyright, right? It's the same thing, but you're just um, using some of the flexibility within the licensing of, of the copyright regime. So there are people such as um, Kim Christian at the uh, uh, Washington State University and her colleagues who have come up with the Makutu system. It's a, it's a way of um, managing uh, information. It's a uh, one type of tool, but along with that, they have developed um, these uh, licenses, uh, traditional knowledge licenses and labels. So ways of trying to add information that there was a student I was, had the pleasure of working with a few years ago who was trying to work with UBC Circle, which is a digital repository um, where they place students' uh, work, graduate theses and other things as well. But most of what's there in Circle right now is um, previous masters and PhD theses that were retroactively made open. So people put things in there not knowing, you know, like decades ago, but now it's all open. So he was trying, a student was trying to add these traditional knowledge licenses and labels to this work so that there would be a way of acknowledging that although they, this might be open, there may be reasons why people need to think about how they're using this. So maybe the, the community where the knowledge comes from has particular concerns about in, that information. And that wasn't built on the um, copyright regime or Creative Commons. It's trying to think of alternative ways of letting people know that information that is open in the legal system might have other cultural ways of thinking about how to use and respect that information. So thinking of alternatives is something that I think we need to do more of in terms of educating people using information that's been made open. Um, I'd like to pick up on um, your point regarding uh, inclusivity and diversity, and in particular, thinking of those um, individuals who, you know, how do we develop materials for individuals who we do want to um, benefit the most? And so, Sue, I'm wondering if I could ask you to respond to this question: Is when we see that higher ed is creating materials, um, and we know that. You know, in general, higher ed is not particularly diverse. Um, we we don't have a very diverse system in place. It is definitely a privileged um, sector. Um, and I'm curious, you know, how when you do look at mater open materials, how inclusive and diverse do you see open materials? And I guess the other question on top of that would be, what do we do about that? How do we how do we make the materials more inclusive and diverse um, for open? I, th I think I'd answer that by stepping back from just open, because I think, because we're all still, 
in, in higher ed and within our within our, our towers of privilege, we're still we're working within those, even though we're working on open. So um, we're functioning within an ecosystem that is set up a certain way. Um, I know i you know the different um, different barriers even for developers as far as there's the old. I mean, it's the, the big time limitation that's always comes into play. Um, so if you are developing something say, and you're intending it to, to share it openly, you're still bound by, say, some of those confines. So I think one of the, where open comes into it is working within the boundaries of our current ecosystem, um, that maybe those who are practicing open need to pause uh, and really reflect on, do I know what privileges I have that I am that I'm bringing to this development, um, and identifying those first, because I think it's when we make make assumptions based on our own privileges that then we are creating materials or we're creating environments that may come with barriers for those who don't have that same privilege. So I don't I don't land it all on open, um, but I think if open is, is really um, serious about being inclusive and beyond, beyond the, um, championing the financial um, aspects of, of that, that freedom and textbook broke, etc. Um, I think if we're really talking about inclusive, there has to be um, a real a pause on what privileges we're bringing, and I'll say ableist, etc., and who is excluded through any choices that I make. And I don't think we will always identify those right away, but the, again, the benefit of what I see, the benefit of open is the responsiveness, that once we have identified that something created a barrier, that we have more of a mechanism for the collaboration, the adopting, the adapting, to then then spread the net further and widen it on who we're including. Thanks. Thank you. Anybody else like to add on to that at all? Regarding inclusivity and diversity. Okay. Oh, yes, yeah. yeah. Um, I think from the student perspective, being in the classroom, having taken courses where um, open initiatives have you know, uh, taken place and profs are engaging students. Um, I think it's really wonderful to see how students feed back into that loop and how they're able to contribute. Uh, I've taken courses where uh, predominantly, like, the classroom structure is that students can respond back um, to the lecture through tweets or through blogs. Um, and there's a reiterative process where the professor um, will go through their lecture and be disseminating knowledge, but students can respond back to it. Um, and I think that's when the, the beauty, I guess, of, of open gets to be seen through that diversity of having more than one person disseminating that knowledge, to be able to fill in gaps continuously, to see students being able to contribute to the lectures aside from just listening, but also be able to um, fill in the gaps, be able to um, ask new questions that will um, hopefully like lead to more and more answers. Thank you. So I'll follow up with that a little bit and ask um, to, to sort of take a critical lens at that look of, of um, having students be contributors. And so I'm curious, what do you think um, would be the risk to students when we ask students to participate in open pedagogy or open, or being participants in that um, lens? Um, so when I think of this, I, I think of it in two parts, I guess. Um, the first part is the professor, um, I, I think when open um, gets talked about in classrooms, the reason why we're doing it often gets overlooked um, and underexplained, um, especially when students don't understand the reason behind um, open and why it's happening in the classroom. Um, I think taking that first step to, to understand, like, uh, the, I guess the explanation to why open can contribute to the classroom, but also when you're looking at risks, how students give that consent to be a part of that open process, to have their information and their knowledge be um, on display um, online and people critiquing that information, how um, through the remixing process that information gets used further on, um, especially when credit is due. Um, will the student get their name on that information? How um, will that credit be taken through the process when someone remixes it and reuses that information? Thank you. Anybody else like to follow up on that in terms of risks to students? Yeah, 
Um, and maybe I'll just take a step back even, since we're taking open kind of broadly here, um, and talking about open education. Um, seems to me that open textbooks are um, a progressive movement on a linear path, which is a model of education where the smart people, I guess, decide um, you know, what the curriculum is gonna be, and every student has to learn it. And to me, that's not really a model of, of open education. Um, that's, I think, education at its best is about dialogue. It's a, it's a way of learning deeply. Um, it's about learning how to think critically, form your own serious questions, learn how to search the literature to see what other scholars have had to say about the subject, being able to evaluate that information, and then come to your own conclusion about what that means. That's what education is, I believe. Um, so when we're talking about risks to students with open, and we're thinking of open more broadly, as I kind of tried to articulate, my response would be, what's the risk of it staying closed? Where we maintain the system of education where it's largely kind of a, I mean, at its most cynical, maybe perspective, kind of a consumption process. So this is the information you need to know, memorize it, and be able to perform it on an examination. So um, I think there's a lot of risk in maintaining that status quo. And I think education at its best is when you have those opportunities to um, kind of become, to, to um, step more deeply into learning. And as an aside, that's part of why I like being a librarian, because we have a collection. And I feel like what we do is we help students um, formulate those serious questions, learn how to search the literature and evaluate evaluate it for themselves. So certainly I'm biased, but when I think about open education, I think about centering it on those values and trying to build a model that looks more like that. Thank you. Um, I have a question, um, it's not on script. Um, so, um, and it's for Lisa, and you had talked about, um, I just want to go back to your point about listening. Um, and I'm really intrigued um, about that because I do think that, that there is sort of this, there is a lack of listening happening. And I guess I'm curious um, if you could just sort of describe a bit more about that in terms of where are you seeing open advocates not listen? And where are you seeing um, the open movement kind of just pushing forward without really taking a pause to reflect and consider others? Okay, big caveat here. I am not like super up on the open literature okay. scholarship. <laughs> I, I have uh, read some of it, but I'm sure there's, um, so I, I don't want to make a sweeping statement that everyone is doing this, but I, I do find um, uh, some of the assumptions and some of the things that I would read with my class, um, a, a core class that I would teach for incoming Master of Library and Information Studies, Courses that would be talking about open access, and it would frame things um, uh, in terms of how faculty would, you know, educators would participate in um, pub in open access journals, right? And and this idea that if they didn't, if they weren't putting their work into open access journals, it was because they were too lazy. Like they would actually be saying, making these claims as though it was because the faculty were not. Um, educating themselves on open access or were too lazy to try something new or you know all of these kinds of things and, and as a faculty member I would be like hmm, this is these are some interesting claims to be made um, uh, when you look at before the um, the opening remarks talking about the infrastructure of the university and the systems that are in place such as tenure and promotion so that not everyone knows this, but there is this thing within academia called for faculty called tenure and promotion. And if you don't make tenure, you lose your job. So it's a it's a pretty big deal. 
Um, it's kind of huge. <laughs> um, uh, as someone who has recently gone through it, because you did your job and your home and all of those sorts of things, um, uh, and uh, the the way that you are evaluated is on the level of the places, the the uh, the uh, prestige of where you publish your work. So if you if your field is one that is not ha doesn't have strong open access journals yet. Um, you are told, do not publish there because you will not get tenure. So it has nothing to do with someone, how hard someone is working or how much they might believe in wanting their work to be out there because the research is, suggests that if it's open, you'll get cited more and who doesn't want to be cited more? But they're told that if you want to succeed and keep your job, don't publish in those, you need to do that. And then maybe in the future, those options will come open. So I think when you, when you read, um, or you hear open access advocates making disparaging comments about why people aren't doing, aren't following what we're doing, that is an example to me of someone who's potentially not listening very well. They're not paying attention to what's actually going on. Like the, you know, generally people in academia are there because they really love it and they are really hooked and nerdy on learning and things like that. They're not generally very lazy people who are, you know, they really care. Uh, about their work and they want others to join it. So potentially there's something else going on if they're not participating in open access so, or open movements. So that would be one example of a potential place where listening might not be happening or more listening might benefit. Sorry, just to add to that from a student perspective, um, I've been on the other side of that having conversations with professors um, and other faculty um, about open education. It's been a very difficult conversation to get from the affordability aspect to the open educational resources and open scholarship aspect. Um, I think the dialogue that tends to happen, especially with textbook broke in the past, the um, campaign is very much centered on the affordability aspect for students. Um, and we do that because we're looking for buy-in. We're looking for students to understand why um, and how open can benefit them. Um, but we've often gotten crit uh, critique that the financial aspect of it is not something that we should be focusing on um, because there's so much more to open pedagogy past that. And I think like having that conversation is difficult and we're trying to constantly um, change how we're having those conversations um, between students and professors to be able to better understand like how can students be a part of this process, creating more resources, uh, more open resources in conjunction with professors, being able to be a part of open scholarship with professors and not imposing that um, it's all about the financial aspect and professors are um, not adopting and it's, it's, it's a problem um, for students. It's trying to figure out new ways to approach um, this topic and create these conversations. Um, I, I guess I, I just would like to put a plug in when we start to get into the open pedagogy side of things and I and I know there's there's lots of excitement and interest in looking at the you know the non-disposable assignment type of thing and the adding real value and giving students a real opportunity and I think that's all all great I think it's just it's important for this movement to also acknowledge that you know one size doesn't fit all and um, and that there may still very well be students who are reluctant to say, share something out in the open. And I think there always needs to be in the same way that when we talk about fundamental accessibility of materials, um, that you need to you know, proactively ensure that it's available in different, in different modes, et cetera. I think there needs to be a little flag as far in as that it, you know, what could be a great open opportunity for some maybe just terrifying for others and um, just sort of sidebar tangentially I think we all are aware of increased uh, calls on um, on services and supports that are institutions related to, to mental health issues and it's like serious anxieties and, and serious um, real real things that that demand our attention and so I just would like to make sure there's a little footnote in the in the notion of open pedagogy and practices that we don't discard opportunities for people to continue to operate, you know, privately, if, if that is an option. Lisa wants to add more. 
so I, I, I don't want to go too far, but I can't resist because as we're talking about um, open pedagogies and students who might be hesitant, one thing that I try hard to do in my classes is to um, have opportunities for students that they're highly uh, interactive and engaging where I try not to be the one speaking all the time and because and, we have 35, 40 people in the room, let's hear from them. We have the luxury, we don't have hundreds of people so in these classes we have enough where we can hear from people, break into small groups, but I do not use or advocate using and have written against using um, things like Twitter and Facebook and um, these these open platforms where the student data is being mined for other purposes um, for that reason. And I think that students should have a safe place to develop their ideas and to develop what, and try out new ideas and, and say things that might, in a couple of months, <laughs> they might not want to say anymore. You know, that's okay. We all put our foot in it, so to speak, um, as I'm doing right now. Anyway, um, but the, the, what really concerns me right now is how some of our, well, all of our learning management systems, which I would like to trust and use for, for students to do that, are also being mined for student data. And I really think there needs to be more conversations around how the data that we're putting into these systems is being used and who has been giving meaningful informed consent on that. I think just building off that as well, at least this point, and thinking about um, the fact that open spaces are not utopic, and that the fact that um, women, um, people of color, indigenous folks who step into uh, open spaces are often attacked. Um, they can be spaces of violence. Lucas and I were talking about this earlier, about how the Trump era has shaped um, knowledge dissemination spaces as well. And Twitter is a, a great example about how um, uh, people in precarious positions who put opinions on Twitter um, can be doxxed, they can be uh, attacked online verbally, and it is a mental, uh, physical stress. Um, and so just to say that, um, but that me, as a white man, can walk into Twitter and say whatever I want, I am going to have a much different experience in an open space um, than a person of color, a woman, than um, a differently abled person might have. Um, so I think really being critical of what it means, and coming from indigenous studies, you only need to go to the comment section at the bottom of a National Post article uh, on an issue, on an article about indigenous issues, to understand the kind of vitriol and hate um, that is spat um, at indigenous peoples who want to engage in an open space. Um, so unless we're really to consider the danger we're asking students, if we're using Twitter as a platform to say, let's talk about indigenous issues, unless you're having a rigorous conversation about what that might mean, and just to say, well, that only happens, it exists online. It's not really, it's not a real thing. Um, it's to disavow the violence of those spaces and the real lived effects it has on students. And I have plenty of examples of, of horrific stuff where um, students have tried to engage the public opinion open space and been damaged because of it. Um, so I think that is a real concern we have to think about when we're engaging open pedagogies. Thank you. I know it sort of becomes at this point when people say, well, that's not real, it's online. It's like, right. really, is online not real anymore? Right. Or, you know, right. The IRL, URL, right. economy doesn't exist. Right. Um, so I'm also, I want to um, tap into um, this idea of ownership, and particularly regarding um, data that um, Lisa was alluding to, and so just to look at you about data. So what I want to know is, and um, I want to speak, uh, I want to get your opinion about consent and conversations and data, and I think consent really is, we're talking across the panel about this as well. So I have two questions. Um, the first is, who, decide, who gets to decide if data should be open or not? And then the second follow-up is, what consent or conversations do participants from whom or where that data is generated need to be involved in opening data? So I'm going to pass the mic over to you. Oi, trying to, that's a, trying to remember those questions. They're, they're complicated. Um, so um, who gets to decide if data should be open? Who gets to decide if data should be open? <coughs> well, this is a good question. And if we look at, we step outside of the university, um, there are laws that govern, or there's legislation that governs um, information and data that has personal information in it. That information can be removed from a data file, for example. 
And then at that point, it is no longer, there's no personal information in the file that's been de-identified, and there's no longer any kind of legislative governance of that. So for example, um, I was in the US recently taking some de-identification training, and almost everyone there was from the medical sector. So um, people who put implants, like medical implants, hospitals, that kind of thing, because that value, that data has a lot of commercial value. And once it's been de-identified, it's no longer regulated by HIPAA, and so it can be sold. Um, and I was thinking about it when we here, actually, leading up to the panel, and I was thinking about it with Statistics Canada, and in fact, um, I don't remember giving consent for my data to be shared from the census. Maybe, it, well, you can't really, I mean, census is mandatory, right? So, but we have public use microdata files of the census, um, we have aggregate statistics that get shared. Same thing with other Statistics Canada products. Um, I don't think that really we have consent for secondary use. It's just assumed that once the data's been de-identified, it can be shared. And so I think this is the kind of dominant model outside of universities. Um, however, in universities and in post-secondary education, um, we tend to value consent more, or maybe we have, it's that we have a history of depending on consent for participation in research projects. So it might be the case in a lot of, for a lot of um, research ethics boards that um, if you want to share your data for secondary use, your research data for secondary use, you need to get consent from your participants first. And I think this is kind of maybe the status quo in general. I think a lot of research ethics boards are still figuring it out, but that seems to be kind of the, the normative way of thinking about it right now. However, to me, um, I would challenge that because, I mean, I have not seen, and I have limited experience, but how can you tell what the secondary use of that data is going to be? How can you know? Who's going to use the data and for what purpose? How can you build that into your consent form? Maybe someone wants to use it after your study's been completed and they've found your article, they found the data, whatever. And if consent can't be specific, is it really meaningful? Can you give meaningful informed consent to all secondary use of data from a research project? I would say maybe not. Um, or if you're giving consent, it's to something a little bit different. So I think right now we're kind of in a, kind of in a, bit of a bind or a situation where there's a lot of complexity that we haven't sorted out in terms of consent and consent for secondary use of data. Um, I think that perhaps a model could be something more like what is done in the UK where you have um, kind of evaluation boards set up to look at projects that want to uh, use data, academic research data, um, and then grant or deny access to that project. So, I mean, I think consent is, I think it's fundamentally problematic when you think about secondary use of data. Um, and I haven't found a really good mechanism to kind of build consent in. Thank you. Um, I have a follow-up question to that, and um, the question is, if instructors have access to student data, can students have access to instructor data to make informed choices? Well, <laughs> um, there's, this is the case that um, some institutions do that. So um, I used to be a student at the University of Toronto and the Arts and Science Students Union, I believe, published something called an anti-calendar where they kind of collected student responses about um, how they felt to courses and faculty and the faculty instructing them on how they perceived it went and they published it. Um, and this was very contentious, not everybody liked it. Um, so um, sometimes students will take that initiative. I would say, um, I mean, the way that question is framed is kind of asking for kind of reciprocity, right? So instructors have access to student information, so students should have access to instructor information. But in a classroom, there is a power dynamic. It's asymmetrical. The instructor has authority. And there are some good reasons why instructors should have access to student information. Um, so, I mean, perhaps, perhaps students should have access to um, teaching, or sorry, data about their the courses and the instructors, but um, I guess 
framing that around um, it being an equal relationship, I think is flawed because it's not equal and kind of imagining it that way is not a very useful way to make a persuasive argument, I would suggest. Do you have feedback to students? <laughs> um, I've been having this conversation a lot lately, actually, about um, what data students can use themselves um, from what they're contributing and like not just instructor data, but how they can use their own data. And it's been very contentious um, in asking like what, how, how will that data be used once it's given to students, uh, especially in terms of like learning analytics, what we can, what we can get out of it. So I don't have an answer for this, but I, it's an ongoing process. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so one of the things um, struck, uh, thinking about data, and um, you were talking about sort of this uh, a model of equity, I guess, between the faculty and students. And one of the things um, regarding access uh, that I'd like to bring up is that often open is predicated upon technology. So the idea is that, well, it's open, and you can download it in any format, and you can get it online in PDF and EPUB. And I'm curious, um, how does that actually create new barriers to access? Okay. Well, I don't know if it's a new barrier, but one thing I think about um, is ebooks, and you know, increasingly relying on ebooks to build our library collections, and the ebook platforms that are most common are not always necessarily accessible. So overall, are we making our collections more or less accessible by depending more on digital formats? Uh, the, the first thing that comes to my mind is, is the digital divide. Uh, and when we're talking about um, communities, uh, a lot of indigenous communities that are working off dial-up or satellite feeds, um, I know I have, I have an animator friend who does animation workshops in remote communities, and her biggest struggle is getting the software to those communities. So taking computers on a ferry to the mainland so she can use the Wi-Fi to download the software that then bring the computers back um, to the community. And the, I mean, the, the footprint surrounding that kind of thing is massive. Um, so, and when we're working with the digital divide, that despite the Canadian government's promise to, to shrink that divide, um, since I think the last report was released in 2005, almost little to nothing has been done to address that. If we're going to continue to premise open on technology without considering the fact that plenty of communities do not have access to that technology, I mean, um, what's the quote? If it's not accessible, then it's not radical. So, um, I think the, the digital divide is something we need to consider, continue to consider. Yeah, I, I full agreement. I guess I'll just uh, add additionally. I mean, I know when we when we talk about you know, financial well-being of students, I, I I know stories at my own institution of, of students who you know can't afford to keep internet um, going. So the, that whole aspect of, of just you know fundamental um, daily practice that interferes. I, I from just a I guess the accessibility point of view, it speaks even further to why we need to have. Um, think about multimodal types of, of access, but um, it, it is that that's a real a real barrier. Regardless of you know whether you're talking about people who have who have access, who can afford to have technology at home, who have um, the skills, even uh, you know if we're talking about people coming along there. So for sure, that's 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 a definite tension, and I'm not sure what else to say other than other than. Um, if, if things are available in, in an old analog format, then mm -hmm. to some extent that creates a, a bit of a bridge. Thank you. Um, I'm going to go off script here again. And uh, I'm really curious, so one of the, one of the areas uh, just recently at the Open Education Conference in uh, California, uh, the theme was equity, inclusiveness, and diversity. And one of um, the keynote speakers was speaking really about the divide between the global south and the global north. So the, this idea that oftentimes it's the global north that is you know, sending content to the global south without very much input in terms of localizing the content, understanding the diverse communities involved. And it made me start thinking very much about the way in which 
we in Canada also create material. So that being from sort of a colonial perspective, settlers' perspective, um, versus becoming very inclusive with the indigenous communities and, and offering and bringing their voice as well um, to curriculum and materials. And I'm curious, both from Lisa and Dave, um, could you just talk about that a bit? Maybe how how to be inclusive and respectful of indigenous communities in the open environment. And I think you sort of spoke about this in the beginning a little bit, but I'd like to bring it back a bit more to that. Uh, um, Non-indigenous person to preface everything I'm going to say based on that, so I don't think I'm really the person to answer that question other than to say conversations. So, so there's there's so many uh, First Nations communities, um, urban indigenous communities, um, all with different epistemologies, ways of being in the world. There's not going to be a single solution or a single way forward. Not that there's a um, that you're asking for a solution, but I think some fantastic relationships and um, ideas to be had and some incredible potential. Um, but I, I think first it needs to recognize that any kinds of conversations along those lines are going to be taking people's time away from pressing issues, let's say, that David was already alluded to, where you're working on just getting water, um, the basic needs met. So maybe open access is not quite the top priority right now, um, but maybe in the future, or maybe there's some things that can be helped along the way to make that a, a higher priority within a community, um, and to be really uh, uh, clear on just having that as a conversation before going and saying, this is what we want to do, we've got this new project, dun, 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 and the conversation's done. Yeah, I think that um, is a really, important point is that in, I think we're at this point right now in open access where it is, um, I might even say, fashionable to include indigenous voices or people of color in the conversation and to do so in the last stage of that conversation um, because it's a checkbox, something to check off. Um, so then inviting people who have had no stakes in the beginning of that conversation, which is frankly bullshit, um, and also to invite those people with no st nothing to give back. Um, so to invite people and not to offer financial recompense, um, to not have something that benefits that community, but is solely benefiting your shirt grant um, or your tenure application without considering what that community gets out of it. Quite often open access projects and academic projects, frankly, work under systems of anonymity. So you're working with indigenous communities and that person isn't even cited uh, in your research project. It becomes just data. It's another, it's a dehumanization. Um, so I think, um, that is a massive part of thinking about where the conversation um, is beginning um, and uh, asking um, community to, to, start, to start the conversation. What does this community need? I think another, for me, another big part is just assuming again and again, and this is a colonial ideology, that indigenous peoples need help with this, that we are going to be saviors and bring this technology. And the fact of the matter is, um, you can look, there is, like Marissa, Marissa Elena Dorade has just written a fantastic book on network sovereignty, where she's talking about how indigenous communities by themselves um, have created inf internet infrastructure on reservations where settler um, infrastructure uh, refuses to go. So these communities do not need us to swoop in and save them. I think the savior ideology is often embedded in a way um, and that there is, those practices um, are in place already. Um, and if we can find ways to get to filter support there, um, to, to stop centering um, settler perspectives and send and push support towards uh, indigenous initiatives that are already happening, um, because there are lots of them and they're fantastic. I, I think there can be, um, there needs to be a, a shift in where, where the resources is going, are going and who we need to push forward and hold up in these conversations. Thank you. Um, so we're going to, um, first off, I just want to say thank you so much to each one of you. And um, I was thinking while you were all speaking that, um, you know, sometimes somebody asks you that question, if you could have, which celebrity would you invite to your dinner table for dinner one night? And I'm thinking, I would not have a celebrity. I would actually love to go out for dinner with each one of you because I feel like I could have this conversation through into the evening. And so I really appreciate all of 
the insights um, and the discussions and critical reflection. I feel like um, I'm speaking with a couple people before um, tonight and I said that I really believe that in British Columbia we are at the stage where we do need to be having these critical conversations about open access and open data and open education and we're, we're there. And so I feel like this is just the start of it. So thank you so much. Um, I'm going to pass it over to Hope Power, who's going to lead us into the next section of the evening, um, which is the provocative question tables. All right, thanks, thanks so much, Amanda. Um, so yeah, what we'd like to do next is to open up this discussion a little bit further by breaking into some small groups. And, uh, and we're going to invite our speakers to, you'll see there are four tables in this room, each with a different uh, colored tablecloth, which will matter in a moment. <laughs> and we're going to be inviting our speakers to uh, each move to one of these tables. Uh, some of our tables will end up with uh, uh, two speakers. And then if you look at the front seat of your chair, you should see the colored dot. <laughs> and this dot will let you know which table um, you should move to. Uh, so you can take a chair and <coughs> Once you've uh, found the color <laughs> of the dot on your chair, you'll be moving to a table. And uh, we'll be at those tables for the next half an hour and make sure to have some time at the end where we can report back on the discussions there. Uh, we only mentioned at the beginning of the night as well that there is a collaborative shared space um, set up where uh, groups are welcome to add notes and capture ideas there, um, or you're welcome just to report back uh, verbally at the end as well. And uh, the, the URL for that shared space is up on the whiteboard there. So uh, let's give this a try. Let's, uh, let's uh, move to our tables and, uh, and follow up with some uh, discussion there. Thank you. I should say each group will have, you know, at least at least a few minutes here to uh, to share. <laughs> Any volunteers? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> reproducibility in data and how that's important and if you um, cut out some of the implied consent, how does that have an impact on being able to reuse data to reproduce science, which is obviously something that's really relevant and important right now. Um, we also talked about friends. <laughs> we did talk about a bit about copyright. Um, I raised the issue of one of the side effects of true openness is you relinquish your baby, your your work into the world, and you don't always get to control what becomes of it after that. Um, and I know for myself, I have often advocated for, for example, CC0 or public domain license, and people don't always understand that that means that, that people can then commercialize your work on your behalf, against your wishes. So you relinquish that right to tell people what they can and can't do with your work sometimes, and that can come back um, to potentially bite you in the butt when you didn't think that that was going to be how your, your work was going to be used. So again, these are questions that we don't always think about in the beginning, and sometimes we are quick to um, want to support openness, and we need to listen more, as Lisa said, which I think is really important. Where is Lisa? <laughs> um, and so we talked a bit about that too, about listening, and how this is a good opportunity to think about what we're advocating for, and how it can have effects on people that aren't coming from the same perspective as we are. Does that summarize our conversation? All right. Thanks so much. Um, who might be the next free volunteer to come up and share? So that's, that's why I volunteer as tribute. Um, 
So the question that was posed is more about what we sort of, what we were thinking about or pondering about um, after the panel or what we wish had been touched on. Um, and so we, we talked actually quite a bit. We have someone at the table who's new to Vancouver. Um, and so we talked a lot about uh, just the, the presence of um, and recognition of and dialogue around um, uh, the indigenous land that we're on, um, r respect for uh, information government, governance in indigenous contexts, um, and, and how it seems to be uh, it seems to be sort of very much ever present on the panel this evening, um, and uh, and sort of around some of the dialogue we were having, and, and one of the points that we kind of discussed as well is that um, this is somewhat unique to Vancouver. Um, and uh, part of that is because we are on unceded territory. Um, we also chatted a little bit about um, the auditing culture of student data. Um, so, you know, this idea that we always have to have these metrics and um, demonstrating value and um, what impacts have been made. And so, with this sort of extraction culture um, around data and around um, information resources. and. Um, that they tied back into sort of the indigenous discussions we were having that indigenous communities aren't unfamiliar with this because it's been happening for a long time in scholarship and so there's uh, perhaps a, a greater awareness um, that uh, communities may have that is starting to sort of infiltrate um, society more at large and sort of um, penetrate conversations a little bit more than um, where it has already been present uh, in community. Um, also, we had a really interesting conversation just about student participation. There was a lot of, um, uh, there was a pleasure that there was a student uh, on the panel saying, awesome, an awesome panel member, and um, uh, sort of discussion around involving students in, um, in decision making and in um, uh, that whole open educational resource discussion. And, and is that actually happening? Like, is, are they uh, part of the decision making, or is this sort of that horse and pony show um, where they're just trying out and uh, visible but not actually participating. So um, I think that, that presence of students is, in the decision making came across as like a really integral part of moving the open um, access movement forward. Anything else that's important? <laughs> Some of us have engaged with um, open, and some of us have engaged with um, digital um, kind of literacy, but in behind um, kind of a password, and how that's the intention of, of engaging um, in the open pedagogy is still somehow closed um, because we were our, our concerns about possible abuse, security or safety of the learning environment, um, and perhaps the quality of the responses um, that will be contributed. Um, and we talked a lot about um, kind of the risks around um, what data, like the, the blind spots that we have um, as, as end users um, trying to engage with um, open. It's an easy place to share, but what are we giving up, what the compromises that we may not be aware of. And um, there are some, um, it's uh, one of them, uh, the uh, participants shared that there is institutions that the risk management um, is, is 
by observing and not doing anything until someone else figures it out um, before they jump on board. Um, and I guess this is our initiative in trying to make it, um, to try to figure out solutions um, and try to have that conversation. Um, is there anything? That's good. considering how closure can lead to access. Um, and we also talked a little bit about um, how licenses, which are um, the idea or the intent is to provide protections, sometimes fails in those protections. Um, and how can we explore that a little bit more to um, ensure that if there are terms of licenses that maybe they have more teeth or more impact. Oh, we discussed Twitter and shame. As, a yes. so, um, <laughs> as the teeth, as the teeth, is the, the current, in, the current, um, yes, the current teeth is how uh, sometimes people who don't have other um, ways to um, enact those protections can take to Twitter. Um, sorry, I'm losing the plot. <laughs> <laughs> it was a far-reaching conversation. It was really in depth, you guys. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> to all of our volunteers. It's uh, really exciting to hear about all of these uh, all of these thoughtful conversations happening as around tension and risk in this area. I know that we're getting close to the end of our time this evening, so I just wanted to turn things over now to my colleague, Rebecca, uh, for some final comments and just a little bit of housekeeping at the end, too. Thank you. 